Greetings and welcome back to Scriptures Unlocked. In the previous presentation, in the series on the Trinity Doctrine Refuted, it was clearly established that Jesus Christ was begotten of the Father and not created. It was also proven from the scriptures that the word begotten simply means to be born. This presentation will further look into the scriptural evidence and address the question, when was Jesus begotten? Was Jesus begotten at his incarnation when he was born of the Virgin Mary? Or was he begotten in the days of eternity before anything was created? However, before doing so, it is important to show the vast difference between begotten and created. And at this time, I'll be sharing my screen so that we can go through the presentations together and you can see the scriptural references that will be used. So at this time, I'll share my screen so that we can go through the presentation together. So last time, as I mentioned, we looked at the difference between begotten and created. The scriptures reveal clearly that Jesus Christ is God's only begotten son. And by him, that is Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are in, in earth, visible and invisible. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. That is according to Colossians 1, verse 16 and 17. Again, my friends, begotten is not equal to created. And to equate begotten with created is essentially to put Jesus on the same level as created beings. I want us to notice Ezekiel chapter 28, which speaks about an anointed cherub, that is an angel, which rebelled against God. This is a clear reference to the devil or Satan. Ezekiel 12. Ezekiel 28 verse 12 says this, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith Jehovah God, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So the devil is a created being. Verse 14 says, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so, and this is God speaking. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou was walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Notice verse 15. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. God, my friends, tells us twice in, this, in these verses that this angel was created. And it is the same word used in the very first verse of the scriptures, Genesis 1 verse 1, which says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The Hebrew word translated as created is bara which is Strong's H 1254. And it occurs 54 times in 46 verses of the Hebrew concordance of the King James Version. Let me show you that from the Blue Letter Bible as we look at the same word that is translated as created, that is used for the devil, Ezekiel chapter 28. Reading from verses 12 to 14. So here it is. So God said that the devil's workmanship and the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was created in, in thee in the day that thou was created. Created here is Strong's H 12 to 4. If I click on that word, here's the pronunciation Strong's H 12.54. Bara. 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 And it means it occurs 54 times, as I mentioned. It is translated create 42 times, creator three times, choose two times, make two times, and so forth. 
outline of biblical usage to create, shape, form, to shape, fashion, create, all with God as a subject, as subject, because God is the creator. And if you go down to, to where that word first appears in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, it says Strong's number H12 to 4 matches the Hebrew bara, which occurs 54 times in 46 verses in the Hebrew. And the very first place in the Hebrew scriptures where bara occurs is in Genesis 1 verse 1. Notice here, in the beginning, God created Strong's H 1254. It is the same word that is used of the devil. So the devil is a created being, while the son of God was begotten. There's a vast difference between those two words. So let's go back to our study notes. So the devil, like all the other angels, were created, whereas Jesus was begotten. So they are not on the same level and cannot be on the same level. They cannot share the same status. My friends, there's indeed a major difference between begotten and created, as can be seen by examining Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, which says this. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. The author is telling us that God created the worlds by the words of his mouth. Because at one point, there was absolutely nothing. And then God spoke worlds and beings into existence. Psalm 33, verse 6 and verse 9 tells us this, that by the word of God, or the word of Jehovah, were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Therefore, my friends, creation is to make something out of nothing. Or in other words, the origin of anything that is created can be traced until you get back to nothing. So there's a vast difference. To create is to make something out of nothing. This point must be emphasized. Or in other words, the origin of anything that is created can be traced until you get back to nothing. A perfect case in point is the creation of mankind. Because the scriptures clearly tell us that Jehovah God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. This is according to Genesis 2 verse 7. However, my friends, when man sinned, God pronounced judgment in Genesis 3 verse 19 by saying, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground for out of it was thou taken for dust thou art and unto dust shall thou return. These verses tell us that Adam was not made from nothing, but instead the first man was created from the dust of the ground. The dust used was clearly taken from the earth and the earth was made from nothing. So if, we're, if we were to trace Adam back before he was created, then we will have to go from dust, earth, then nothing because God spoke our planet into existence from nothing. So Adam was not made from nothing. He was made from the dust of the ground and the dust of the ground was a part of the earth. So if we were to trace Adam back, we'd have to go with dust, earth, and then there would be nothing. The following verses in Genesis one prove that earth, that is dry land from which the dust was taken was spoken, spoken into existence. This is Genesis one verse nine. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. So God called the dry land into existence. Therefore, God spoke the dry land into existence from nothingness and it appeared. Verse 10 says, and God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called the seas. And God saw that it was good. Ladies and gentlemen, Everything that is created can be traced back to nothing before God brought them into existence. Therefore, if we were to trace the devil or Satan, the anointed cherub, we will go right back to nothing. However, Jesus Christ was begotten of the Father. And if we were to trace Christ back, 
we would have to go directly through the Father and we will never get to a beginning. This is simply because God the Father is eternal. And you can see that by these verses that are on the screen. Genesis 21, verse 33, Psalm 41, verse 13, Isaiah 40, verse 28, Jeremiah 10, verse 10, and so forth. But I want to zero in on Isaiah 40, verse 28. Let's look at this from the scriptures, Isaiah 40, verse 28. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Isaiah 40, verse 28. This is what the scriptures tell us. Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, Yehovah, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Notice what the scriptures said, that God, you refer, it, the scriptures refer to God as the everlasting God. Yehovah, that is his name, the creator of the ends of the earth. So God is everlasting. God is eternal. And let's turn to Jeremiah 10 verse 10 while we are here. Jeremiah 10 verse 10 gives us another, another insight. It says, but Yehovah is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. So here, Yehovah, the true God, is the living God, but not just the living God, an everlasting king, God, the one true God, is eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end. So the scriptures are very clear that if we were to trace the Son of God who came from the Father, we will have to go through the Father. And we will never get to a beginning because God has no beginning. Friends, the Father and Son share the same divine nature. So Jesus' very essence and substance had no beginning because it all came from the Father, the source of all things. However, Jesus' personality as the Son of God had a beginning when he was brought forth from the Father. So there's a difference. His nature is eternal because he's, he shares his father's divine nature. And God, by nature, is spirit. And the Bible refers to God as the eternal spirit. However, the personality of the Son of God had a beginning when he was brought forth from the Father. Jesus is the literal divine Son of God because he was born of God. Therefore, he inherited everything from God the Father, including his divinity. Hebrews 1 corroborates this fact when speaking about God's Son. Notice what Hebrews chapter 1, reading from verse 1 onwards, tell us. God, that is the Father, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, that is Jesus, whom he, God the Father, hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Who, Jesus, being the brightness of his, that is the Father's glory, and the express image of his person, that is the Father's person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And notice what verse 4 tells us, that Jesus inherited something from his Father. So Jesus being made so much better than the angels, as he, that is Jesus, hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, that is the angels. So here it is again, that you cannot equate begotten to being created, because here the Father is telling us that the Son was made so much better than the angels, as he is by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, the angels. Jesus, by virtue of his divine birth, inherited a more excellent name than the angels. And that name is God. God is a name as well as it denotes the nature of God. God is a, is a title of deity, but it also describes his nature, which is divine. Notice, my friends, that God the Father himself makes a clear distinction between begotten and created. This is very important. 
God the Father makes a clear distinction between begotten and created. Notice Hebrews 1 verse 5. The Father is speaking. For unto which of the angels said he, that is the Father, at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. This verse tells us that angels who are created beings are not and cannot be on the same level as the divine son of God who was begotten of the father because it was Jesus himself who created all the angels. Friends, there's a great gulf fixed between the creator and the creature. So the two must never ever be equated because there is a vast difference. Hebrews chapter one speaks about the second time the son of God was begotten. And I want us to pay keen attention to these words in Hebrews one verse six. And again, when he that is the father bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. This verse is clearly speaking about when Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary at his incarnation and tells us that God brought his first begotten, which is Strong's G 4416 into the world. Hebrews chapter one, verse six also states that God commanded all the angels to worship him, even as the son of man, because Jesus was still the divine son of God. Let us go to Hebrews chapter one and look at the original Hebrew for first begotten. Hebrews chapter one, verse six. Hebrews chapter one, reading from verse six. I want to show you the original Greek for first begotten. And, and again, when he bring it in the first begotten into the world, he said, and let all the angels of God worship him. First begotten is Strong's G 4416. This is the pronunciation of the Greek. Strong's G 4416, Prototokos, Prototokos. Prototokos. And it means, it, first of all, it occurs nine times. It is translated firstborn seven times, first begotten two times. It means, outline of biblical usage, firstborn of man or beast, of Christ, the firstborn of all creation. So when the scriptures tell us that God brought his first begotten into the world, God is saying that his son was born in eternity past, in the days of eternity, and he was the firstborn in the universe. And he was begotten again as the son of man. So he brought the first begotten into the world to be born a second time in the womb of Mary. So let's go down to, to this Strong's definition, Prototokos, firstborn, usually as, as a noun, literally or figuratively. And Jesus was begotten literally. It's not a metaphor. It's not figurative. He's a first begotten or firstborn. And you can see how it is used in the scriptures. Look at this verse, Matthew 1, 25, and knew her not. This is talking about Joseph. Joseph knew her, is Mary, knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, that is Prototokos. And he, and he called his name Jesus. So the word simply means firstborn. It's a literal birth. So the scriptures are very clear. And these are all the verses in which firstborn appears. Luke 2 verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So this is clearly talking about Hebrews 1 verse 6 is talking about Jesus' incarnation when he was born a second time. So he's not the son of God when he was born of the Virgin Mary. He was already the son of God in heaven because the Bible describes him as the first begotten was, was, was brought into the world. So look at all these verses. Colossians 1.15, speaking of Jesus, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Doesn't mean that he's a creature. He is the firstborn and he's the one that created all things. Colossians 1.18, 
and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. This is talking about the third time that he was born. He was born from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And then Hebrews 1 verse 6, which is what we are looking at. Hebrews 11, 28, this is speaking about what happened in way back in, in Exodus, when the children of Israel left Egypt. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So the tenth and last plague of Egypt was the death of the firstborn. This is what it is reference, referencing. Hebrews 12, 23, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, that is the church of Christ, because he is the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. So the scriptures are very clear that Jesus is the firstborn of God. And he was born a second time at the incarnation when, he, when Mary gave birth to him. So Jesus is the first begotten child in the entire universe. So let us continue as we continue to dissect the scriptures. So as the son of God, Jesus is the prince of heaven and the savior of the world. Protocos appears only nine times, as I mentioned, in nine verses in the Greek. And it is translated firstborn seven times and first begotten two times. Notice as well, my friends, a very important word it was used in Hebrews 1 verse 6. Notice that the verse mentions the word again, which is only used when something was done before. And according to the Oxford Dictionary, again simply means another time or once more. In other words, Jesus was the firstborn child in the universe when he was brought forth as a divine son of God. Then the scriptures tell us when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, that is the firstborn son that was already in heaven, made of a woman or born of a woman to be begotten a second time as the son of God and the son of man. So notice again the, the verse. And again, and again, when the father, when he bring it into in the first begotten into the world, he was already first begotten before he was brought into the world. He said, and let all the angels of God worship him. So it is clear that Jesus was begotten a second time when he was born as the son of man. This presentation is look, looking at when was Jesus begotten? And now we're going to be looking at some scriptures that tells us when Jesus was begotten. Because we know, and that verse, Hebrews 1 verse 6, tells us that Jesus was not begotten as some people would have you believe when he was born of the Virgin Mary. He was begotten ages before that, in the days of eternity. And the scriptures will prove that by looking at the original Hebrew and even the Greek. So when was Jesus begotten? This is what we will address going forward. So it has been clearly established that Jesus was begotten as the son of God before his incarnation in Bethlehem. This is evident again from the fact that all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1 verse 3. If he was begotten only at Bethlehem, how then could he have created all things if he was just receiving life as the son of God when he was born of the Virgin Mary. The scriptures are very plain, my friends. Jesus was begotten ages ago as the divine son of God in heaven. Let's continue. Jesus Christ, the literal son of God, was brought forth or begotten from God the Father before anything was created in the universe. Jesus is called God's holy child twice in the scriptures. He's called God's holy child twice. And this is proven by referencing Acts 4, reading from verse 26 onwards. This is what Peter said. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against Jehovah and against his Christ. And this verse is a direct quote from Psalm 2, verse 2. Acts 4, 27 says, For of a truth against thy holy child, Jesus, 
whom thou was anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. So Peter is saying that this is a fulfillment of Psalm 2, verse 2. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy count to determine before to be done. And now, Jehovah, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. So Peter understood that Jesus was the son of God, not just at his incarnation, but also in, in the days of eternity, Jesus was begotten of the father. When was Jesus begotten of the father? Does the scripture provide the answer to such a question? My friends, it most certainly does. In Proverbs chapter eight, reading from verse 22 to 30. This passage has been misused, misinterpreted and misunderstood. But as we search the scriptures and look at the original Hebrew, it will clearly reveal that the son of God had a beginning. Proverbs eight, verse 22 to 30, will clearly reveal by looking at the original that the son of God had a beginning, which means Jesus cannot be co-eternal with the father as the Trinity doctrine claims. Trinitarians have ignored Proverbs chapter eight and what it is teaching by claiming that the chapter is just a metaphor for wisdom and has nothing to do with Jesus Christ being brought forth by God the Father in the days of eternity. The last presentation, I played a clip from Pastor Doug Batchelor. I want us to listen again to what he had to say as it relates to Proverbs 8. And I will play the, the video. I'll just play about two minutes of the video so that we can actually see, see and hear what Pastor Doug had to say as it relates to Proverbs 8 and how he views Proverbs 8 in relation to Jesus. Then I will explain and break it down by doing a detailed exposition on Proverbs chapter 8, in particular, verse 22 to 30. Listen to what Pastor Doug has to say. Now, then there'll be people who look at Proverbs 8. Let me read this to you. Proverbs 8, and I'm going to read verse 22 to 25. They believe this is a, uh, a prophecy speaking about Jesus. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his ways, before his works of old. I had been established from everlasting, from beginning, before the earth was ever an earth. When there was no depths, I was brought forth. They're saying, see, he was from everlasting, but it says that he was brought forth. They say this is about Jesus. Keep reading. When there were no fountains abounding with waters, I'm in Proverbs chapter um, 8, verse 25. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. Why he had not made the earth of the fields of the primal dust of the world. It's not saying that Jesus was brought forth before the world was created. This song is not a proverb. It's in the book of Proverbs, but it's one of the songs of Solomon. It starts with verse 8. It has nothing to do with Jesus being brought forth. It is a, a metaphor for wisdom, the whole thing. Let's just look at some of the examples in here. Uh, Proverbs 8, verse 1, does wisdom cry out and understand, lift up her voice. She takes her stand on the top of the hill. The whole thing is talking about wisdom and the importance of wisdom. And you just go to some of the following verses. Verse 12, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. I find out knowledge and discretion. Go to verse 14, counsel is mine, sound wisdom. I am understanding, I have strength. This is just a soliloquy. It's just a, a song of Solomon dealing with wisdom and the importance of wisdom. Wisdom was brought forth in the very beginning. It's not talking about Jesus. And so that, that's one of the arguments that I've heard before. But uh... Okay, my friends. So you have heard it from Pastor Bachelor himself, what he thinks of Proverbs 8. And as I've mentioned, he's a pastor that I have, I've learned a lot from and have a lot of respect for. But as I mentioned in the previous presentation, he's entirely wrong as it relates to what Proverbs 8 is actually teaching. And I will explain this as we proceed in the presentation going forward. So let us now go back to our study notes as we examine the scriptures and look at what the Bible is actually revealing by looking at the original language. I'm a big fan of going back to the original language. 
simply because when, when translations are done, oftentimes meanings are lost in translation. And it is important to go back to the original to look at how the word is used in various verses to get a very good idea as to what the word actually means. And this is what we will be doing. I'll be presenting a lot of scripture to prove everything that will be stated. And I want you to have an open mind and look at the evidence that is being presented. And at the end of it all, make up your own minds as to what the scriptures are revealing. And you will see clearly after I'm through that Proverbs 8 is actually speaking about Jesus himself, as you will see for yourself. So pay keen attention to the verses. I'll be going all over the scriptures to make the case and to look at the original Hebrew and Greek. And you will see that Proverbs 8 is talking about Jesus Christ. And actually Jesus is telling us what transpired before and during the creation of the earth from his standpoint. Let's go to our study notes. Let's now examine the scriptures and notice that wisdom is being personified. According to dictionary.com, personification is defined as the attribution of human nature or character, character to animals, inanimate objects or abstract notions. The Oxford Dictionary also defines personification as a person or thing regarded as embody, embodying a quality, concept, etc. Friends, there is absolutely no denying that Proverbs 8 is dealing with wisdom. Nobody can deny that. In fact, wisdom is the one that is speaking and is in fact the subject of the entire chapter. Question is, who is wisdom? That is what we need to understand. Who is wisdom? Who is speaking? Consider these verses, and it will clearly show that wisdom is indeed a person. Notice the following text of scripture. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 24 says this. Paul is writing, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The apostle Paul refers to Christ as both the power of God and the wisdom of God. Notice the following verses. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. If you notice, I've highlighted wisdom and Jesus in red. So it stands out off the page. So Paul is saying here that Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us wisdom. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7 to 8. Notice what the verse says. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. This is a clear reference to Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory who was crucified. Jesus was the one who was crucified, and he's the wisdom of God. Jesus even tells the Pharisees that he is the wisdom of God. And this can be clearly seen when we compare Matthew's account with the parallel account found in Luke's gospel. Let's harmonize the gospel. And when I say harmonize the gospel, if you want to know what a particular passage says, especially in the gospels, you need to get all the parallel passages in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if all four have written on the same incident, put them together and you will get a fulsome picture as to what is being said. Because what happens in the, in the Gospels is that each particular writer will give you from their vantage point what they want to bring out as they are being led by the Spirit. But when you put all the, the Gospel accounts on a particular incident, or event together, you will get added information from one or more of the gospel writers. So let's do that now. Matthew 23, verse 34 says this, and this is Jesus speaking. Wherefore, behold, I, that is Jesus, 
send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. This is what Matthew wrote. Notice how Luke explains this statement that Jesus made. Luke 11, verse 49. Luke says, Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I, that is Jesus, will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute. So Matthew said that Jesus said, I will send you prophets and apostles. Some of them you will beat, some of them you will slay, and some you will persecute. Luke, commenting on the same statement that Jesus made, said, therefore also said the wisdom of God, and this is a direct quote from Jesus. Jesus refers to himself as the wisdom of God and says, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute. This was actually fulfilled in the time of Saul, who became Paul, because Paul himself persecuted the saints. And as a matter of fact, let me just give you a quick reading of what transpired to fulfill the prophecy that Jesus made in those verses. Acts chapter 8. It is entitled, Saul persecutes the church. And notice this. This was right after Stephen was stoned. So Stephen was one of those prophets and apostles that were slain. And Saul was consenting unto his death. That is Stephen's death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen, there it is, to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Verse three, and Saul, and as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. And as a result of the persecution, notice what happens in verse four. Therefore they were scattered abroad and they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. So this incident was a fulfillment of what Jesus spoke in Matthew and Luke's account. So my friend, Jesus here is referred, according to Luke, Jesus referred to himself as the wisdom of God and said, I will send them prophets and apostles and some of them they shall slay and persecute. The Bible plainly reveals from those verses that I have mentioned and cited that Jesus, the son of God, is indeed the wisdom of God. Jesus Christ, wisdom personified, is speaking through Solomon, the wisest man that has ever lived in Proverbs 8. Friends, this is no coincidence that Solomon was the one inspired to write these words because the spirit of Christ or the wisdom of God was in him, as can be seen in 1 Kings chapter 3. Reading from verse 28, but the background to verse 28 is a story where two harlots gave birth to sons. You can read the account in 1 Kings 3 verse 28. As a matter of fact, let me just quickly go there because I like to prove everything. And I like to, this channel is called Scriptures Unlocked. So I like to allow the scriptures to speak. So let's go there. First Kings, instead of me paraphrasing. First Kings chapter three, reading from verse, verse, let me see, verse 16. And the background to this is Solomon, God appeared to Solomon in a dream. And God said to Solomon, ask of me anything and I will grant it. And Solomon asked God for understanding and a wise heart so that he may be able to lead God's people. And as a result of what Solomon asked, God was pleased and God granted him wisdom. And if you go up here, you will see it just to make the point. And God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing, and has not asked for thyself long life, neither has asked riches for thyself, nor, nor has asked the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, 
neither after thee shall there shall any arise like unto thee. And I have all oops, and I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream, and he came to Jerusalem. So the very first Solomon judges wisely judges. So the very first instance where Solomon got the chance to use his wisdom that God had just given him was in 1 Kings 3, verse 16. And notice what the scripture tells us. Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And the one woman said, O oh, my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was, was delivered also, and we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her, in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I arose in the morning to give, to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my, my son, which I did bear. And the other woman said, nay, but the living is my son and the dead is thy son. And this said, and this said, no, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. So one was saying, the dead is my son. Other is saying, the living is my son. Then said the king, the one said, this is my son that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other said, nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her, her son, the maternal instinct kicked in. And she said, oh my Lord, give her the living child and in no wise slay it. But the other said, let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Then the king answered and said, give her the living child and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And notice verse 28. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged. And they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. Solomon had the spirit of Christ. He had the spirit of God. And it was the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, that gave him wisdom. So the scriptures are very plain if we allow the scriptures to speak. So it was no coincidence that Solomon was, was the one that was inspired to speak that Jesus used to speak through as it relates to wisdom because Solomon was the wisest man that has, that has ever lived and Jesus is the wisdom of God. My friends, we are looking at Proverbs chapter, chapter 8. Another argument that is usually made as to why wisdom cannot refer to Jesus is the use of the feminine pronoun she. However, my friends, in Hebrew, all nouns are either masculine or feminine. And wisdom just happens to be a feminine noun. To answer this objection, let's look at Jesus' own words in Matthew 23 and the parallel verse in Luke 13, verse 34. This is what Jesus said. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He was actually, this is the time when Jesus wept. He was weeping over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. Jesus also wept at, I think, believe Lazarus' graveside. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and he would not. The Son of God likened and compared himself to a hen, a female bird, in describing how he wanted to treat the people of Israel in gathering them unto himself, but they refused. So that argument holds no water, that wisdom cannot be used to refer to Christ because wisdom is a she. My friends, having clearly established that wisdom is indeed a person, 
and that Jesus is wisdom personified. Let's now look at what Jesus said about himself. In reading Proverbs 8, it is evident that wisdom is not just an abstract notion, but Jesus is clearly speaking about himself. Notice what he says. Proverbs 8, verse 4. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of man. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. And we all know that Jesus is also truth personified. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is also truth personified, not just wisdom personified. Proverbs 8, verse 8, all the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. And I want us to look at Isaiah 11, verse 5, verse 1 to 5, which uses all five of these references. Righteousness, counsel, wisdom, understanding, strength, or might. Notice Isaiah 11, verse 1 to 5. Friends, I've done all the hard work for you. I've searched the scriptures and I'm presenting the facts to show that wisdom is indeed a person and that person is the divine son of God himself. So notice what Isaiah 11 verse 1 to 5 is saying. Isaiah 11 verse 1 to 5. Notice. Righteousness reigns, righteous reign of the branch. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his loins, out of his roots. This is speaking about Jesus. And the spirit of Jehovah shall rest upon him. And notice what, what the spirit will, will give him. The spirit of wisdom. Proverbs 8 is talking about wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might, which is strength. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Jehovah. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of Jehovah. And he shall not judge after, after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reign, reigns. So the scriptures are very plain if we just search the scriptures and allow the scriptures to speak. So Solomon here is being inspired. Jesus is speaking through Solomon. And Solomon is here, saying, is saying here, all the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. And we saw all those elements in Isaiah 11, verse 1 to 5. Let us continue. Proverbs 8, verse 17. Jesus is saying, I love them that love me. And those that seek me early shall find me. And you can see John 14, verse 15, and in particular, Verse 21, I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the path of judgment that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance and I will fill their treasures. And then we get to the part where Jesus tells us when he was begotten, when he was born. And Isaiah 8, not Isaiah, I beg your pardon, Proverbs 8, verse 22 to 30 brings out this clearly by looking at the original Hebrew. The scriptures tell us here, Jehovah possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. So from, just from reading the plain English, it says the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. And when did the Lord possess Jesus? Before his works of old. So he was possessed before anything was created. That is plain just by reading the, the very English. But let's now dissect this verse by looking at the original Hebrew to reveal the truth of what is being said by Jesus, the Son of God. The Lord in the Hebrew is Jehovah, which is the name of God the Father. And it's clearly referring to God the Father. The Hebrew word translated as possessed is Kana, Strong's H 70, 69. And it means to buy, to get, acquire, or obtain. And I want to go to the the actual original so you can see it 
for yourself. Proverbs 8, verse 22. So it says, Yehovah possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. Possessed here is Kana. This is the pronunciation. Strong's H, 7069. Kana. 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 And it occurs 84 times. It means to buy, translated by 46 times, to get 15 times, purchased five times, possessor three times, possessed two times, and so forth. It means to get, acquire, create, buy, possess. But we know that the Son of God was not created. So that meaning does not apply to him. It says to get, acquire, obtain of God originating, creating, redeeming his people. So when God creates us, God owns us. We are his twice by creation, once by creation and once by redemption. He's the possessor, he's the owner of heaven and earth. And it is also used of Eve acquiring. Notice again, it says to be bought. And it is the same word that is used by Eve in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And here it is. Strong's number H7069 matches the Hebrew Kana which occurs 86 times in 76 verses in the Hebrew. And it is the same word that is used by Eve when she gave birth to her, her first son, Cain. Notice what the scripture tells us. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. And this is what he said, I have gotten, that is Cana, a man from Jehovah. So when she gave birth to Cain, she said that she acquired she obtained, she got a man child, a son from Jehovah. So when Jesus says, Jehovah possessed me, he's saying that the father gave birth to me. And he tells you when that took place, before his works of old. So let us look at, let's go back to our, our study notes. Many persons might not want to accept that, but that is what the scripture is teaching. So, it is the same, Kana is the very same word that is used by Eve when Cain was born. And we looked at that earlier. After giving birth to her firstborn son, Eve stated that she had gotten, acquired, or obtained a child from God. Similarly, Jesus is telling us that God the Father got, acquired, or obtained him, and also said that this happened before his works of old. The Hebrew word translated as before is Kedem. Strong's age 69, 24, and it means ancient time. And let's actually go there. So we're we are looking at the original because that tells us and shows us the actual meaning that is intended. Before Strong's age 69, 24, this is telling us when Jesus was begotten. So it is Kedem. This is the pronunciation. Strong's H, 6924. Kedem. 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 It is translated, it, is, it occurs 87 times. It is translated as East 32 times. And East here means because in Hebrew, Hebrew, the Hebrews read from right to left, whereas we read from left to right. So East is the beginning. East and they move to the West. So east is, is always the earliest point. East 32 times, east what 11 times, ancient six times, east side before three times. It says here east, outline of biblical usage, east antiquity, front, that is that which is before a four time. Ancient time, a four time, ancient from of old, earliest time. These are the meanings, beginning. Strong's definition gives us the same thing. And if you look at Brown Driver Briggs lexicon, it gives you some of the verse in which this is it, this is this word is used and the meaning. So it says from ancient time, a four time. Deuteronomy 33, 15 says, and for the chief things of the ancient mountains, so the mountains are of old, from when God created the world, and for the precious things of the lasting hills. From, so, Psalm 68, 34, speaking about God, 
Ascribe his strength unto God. His excellence is over Israel and his strength is in the clouds. Isaiah 19, verse 11, talking about, notice the verse, surely the princes of Zoan are fools. The counsel of the wise, counsel, the counsel of the wise counsels of Pharaoh is, a, is become brutish. How say ye unto Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings or olden kings. So this is how the word is used. It is a time long ago, alone as adverb anciently of old. And you'll notice the same idea here in Psalm 74. Psalm 74 verse 2. Remember thy congregation which thou hast purchased of old. The rod of thine inheritance which thou hast redeemed. This Mount Zion wherein thou hast dwelt. So the verse is, is it, the, the word before in the context is talking about a long time ago. So what you think is that this, when he was begotten, happened before God's work of old. And that happened before anything was created. So the scriptures, when we allow the scriptures to, to speak, and especially when we look at the original, we will see the clear meaning of the word. So Jesus was begotten a long time ago in ancient times before anything was created. Proverbs 8, 23. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. Let's examine the words used for to set up and everlasting, to see the idea that is being conveyed. So let's go to the original Hebrew again. We're looking at the word set up to see what is being conveyed. Jesus is saying, I was set up from everlasting. Strong's age, 52, 58. This is the, the Hebrew word, Nasa. Strong's age, 52, 58. Nasah. Nasah. It means, it occurs 25 times. It means to pour out 12 times. It is translated that way 12 times, pour four times, and so forth. Set up one time. Outline of biblical usage. To pour out, pour, offer, cast to anoint as a king. And strong definition, to pour out especially a libation or to cast metal by analogy to anoint a king. So what Jesus is saying is that he was anointed as king. And I'll explain why later. So it is clear that Jesus here is saying that he was set up, he was anointed as king. And the other word, let's go back to our, our study notes. The, so, nasa means to pour out or to anoint. So Jesus is clearly telling us that he was installed, set up, and an anointed king because he shares his father's throne as the son of God. This is precisely why Hebrews 1 verse 2, my friends, states that Jesus is appointed ear of all things. And when titimi, that is a Greek word translated as appointed, is consulted, the same idea to set, to establish, or ordain is maintained. Notice what God the Father said concerning his son in Psalm 2, verse 6, which uses the same word, nasa. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So God is saying to us that he has anointed and he has set his king that is his son upon his holy hill of Zion. The Greek word translated as here is Kleronomos, Strong's G 2818. And it means one who receives his allotted possession by right of sonship. And this is very important because Jesus, being the divine son of God, gives him right as the heir to the throne of the universe. Just as though Prince Charles is the here to the throne of the British, of the British monarchy. He, as the son of Queen Elizabeth II, is the heir apparent. He is the next in line to the throne of England. So, according to Oxford Dictionary, an heir, as we all know, is a person legally entitled to the property or rank of another on that person's death. While Dictionary.com defines an heir as a person who inherits or is entitled to inherit the rank, title, position, etc. of another. 
But guess what? God the Father, the sovereign king of the universe, cannot die because he's the only being who has immortality, according to 1 Timothy 6, verse 16. Therefore, Jesus, the Son of God, has been made equal with the Father and shares the throne of the universe by virtue of his divine birth. God the Father cannot die, so Jesus will never, if it was according to human standards, will never be able to ascend to the throne. And that is why he has been made equal with the Father. And that is precisely why he shares his Father's throne. And his Father has set him up as king upon his holy hill of Zion. Jesus, my friends, the heir to the throne of the universe, inherited all the Father's divine prerogatives, name and titles. Notice Hebrews 1 verse 8, which is very important. Notice what the Father says. But unto the Son, he, that is God the Father, said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. The Father clearly calls his Son God, because Jesus is the Son of God and inherited his Father's divinity. It is his divinity that makes him God. Not that he is the God of the Bible. He is the Son of the God of the Bible. And because he is divine, he is called God. He inherits the name God because he is divine. However, I want us to notice keenly that even though Jesus is called God, the Father makes it absolutely clear that he is still the God of Jesus. Many persons might not have realized that. But Jesus has a God. His Father is his God. And this is proven in Hebrews 1 verse 9. Most persons just stop at verse 8. But notice verse 9. The Father continues to speak. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, that is the Father, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So Jesus has a God. His Father is his God. So let's now examine when Jesus was set up by looking at the word everlasting. The Hebrew word translated as everlasting is olam, Strong's age 57, 69. It occurs 438 times in 413 verses. So let's look at olam and what idea is being conveyed from this verse. So we looked at set up which means Jesus was anointed king. He shares his father's throne and he was set up from everlasting. What does everlasting mean? The, the verse actually tells us from the beginning or ever the earth was. I will get to what the beginning mean, but let's look at everlasting. Strong's H 5769. This is the pronunciation. Strong's H 5769. Olam. 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 It occurs 439 times. It is translated ever 272 times. Everlasting 63 times. Old 22 times. Perpetual 22 times. Evermore 15 times. Never 13 times. Ancient five times. And you can see the rest of the meaning and how the word has been translated. Outline of biblical usage. Long duration. Antiquity. Futurity. Forever. Ever. Everlasting, evermore, perpetual, old, ancient world. It means ancient time, long time, as in of the past. It can also be used to tell us about future time, forever, always, continuous existence, perpetual, everlasting, indefinite or unending future, eternity. So this is how the word olam, these are all the meanings of the word olam. And you can look at all the verses by doing your own study of the word olam. But it is important for us to understand how this word is translated and what is the intended meaning depending on the context of the verse. So this word can be translated in a, in a number of ways. And we looked at those, those words. And Strong's definition reads as follows. Let me actually go back and show you from Strong's, from the Blue Letter Bible itself, even though it is written there in the notes, so you can see it for yourself. So Strong's definition, Olam, 
properly concealed, that is the vanishing point, generally time out of mind, and that can be past or future, a time that we cannot fathom, that is practically eternity. So this is what the word means. So let us continue. So it is important, my friends, to note that the word forever does not always mean time without an end. And neither does everlasting mean time without a beginning in every single instance. This is very important. We, when we think about forever, think about time without an end. But that is not how the writers of the scriptures always use that word. The meaning of the word is highly dependent on the subject of the verse. That is, who or what is being referred to. This is why context of a verse is absolutely important because context, context is always king when studying the scriptures. Here are a few examples to prove that Olam, that is Strong's H 5769, which is sometimes translated as forever and everlasting, does not always mean unending time or time without a beginning. Notice these verses, which uses forever Strong's H 5769. And look at the context of the verses. Exodus 21, verse 6. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. And he shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl. And he shall serve him forever. The context of this verse is that every six, whenever a Hebrew has a slave or a servant, that servant should serve for six years, and in the seventh year, he should be set free. And the scriptures say, if, if after the six years, the slave doesn't want to leave, then the master should bring him to the judges and bring him to the door or the doorpost and shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him, how long? Forever. What does forever mean? It does not mean for all time. It simply means for as long as the slave lives. The slave who refused to leave his master when he set free after six years of service shall be required to serve for as long as he lives or forever. Second place, second verse I want to cite is 1 Samuel 1, 22, which also proves that forever does not always mean time without an end. This is the story of Hannah, the wife of Elkanah, Samuel's mother. She was barren. And she prayed to God for a child. And God heard her request and granted her her request. And when Samuel was born, this is what happened. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before Jehovah, and there abide for how long? Forever. Hannah brought her son Samuel to Shiloh and paid keen attention to her words, which explains the meaning of forever. So Hannah explains what forever means. This is what Hannah said in 1 Samuel 1, verse 27 and 28. This is what she said. For this child I prayed, and Jehovah hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to Jehovah. For how long? As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to Jehovah, and he worshipped Jehovah there. The scripture interprets itself. And it is clear, my friends, from these verses that forever means as long as Samuel lived. Final verse I'll, I'll cite is Jonah 2, verse 6. And we know the story of Jonah. Jonah was swallowed by a whale because he was fleeing from what God had asked him to do. And this is Jonah in the belly of the whale. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me for how long? Forever. Yet has thou brought up my life from corruption, O Jehovah, my God. Jonah's experience, my friends, in the belly of the whale seemed to him like forever. But in reality, the scripture reveals in Jonah 1 verse 17 that Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I have said that Jonah was in the, in the belly of the whale because Jesus in Matthew 12 verse 40 tells us that the big fish that swallowed Jonah 
was indeed a whale. Matthew 12, verse 40. Let me just prove that quickly. Matthew 12, verse 40. Matthew 12, verse 40. Jesus is commenting on that incident with Jonah. And notice what Jesus said. For as Jonas was three days and three nights, there it is again, three days and three nights, Jonah said he was there forever. For as Jonas was there three days and three nights in the whale's belly, there it is, whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jonah was swallowed by a whale. So forever doesn't always mean time without an end. And even today, we use the same terminology. We might be waiting on someone for about, say, an hour. And when the person arrives, we might say, I've been waiting forever. But how long did we actually wait? About an hour. But the time seems so long, it could be classified as forever. So forever does not always mean time without an end. So let us continue to dissect the scriptures. So in the three verses cited above, the Hebrew word translated as forever is olam. Strong's age 5769. And it was clearly shown that the meaning of forever does not always mean unending time in the future, but a definite time or as long as a person shall live. So what about everlasting? Does it always mean a time without a beginning? So forever doesn't always mean a time without an end. Does everlasting always mean a time without a beginning or unending future? Because Jesus said, that he was set up from everlasting. Was it everlasting from when God the Father has always existed? Or does Jesus have something else in, in mind? Does everlasting, as we understand it today, mean, mean unending future or a time without a beginning? Let's look at the scriptures. Notice as well these verses which prove that everlasting does not always mean a time without a beginning based on the subject of the verse. Genesis 49, verse 26 says this, the blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the uttermost bound of the everlasting hills. Everlasting here is Strong's age 57, 69, Olam. The hills are not everlasting. They, have no, is, they cannot be said to have no beginning because the hills were brought forth when our planet was created. Jacob continues, they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Notice Habakkuk, 6, Habakkuk 3, verse 6. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove us under the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills, perpetually strong, age 57, 69, Olam, did bow. His, that is God's ways, are everlasting. Same word, strong, age 57, 69. These two verses, my friends, are referring to the hills as everlasting and perpetual, respectively. But the hills came into existence when God created the world. Therefore, everlasting in the context of those verses can be traced back to a starting point, or in other words, the beginning of planet Earth. Habakkuk 3 verse 6 is also very interesting because it uses Olam twice, once to describe the hills as perpetual, and another time to describe God's way as everlasting. Let us just look at that. Habakkuk 3, verse 6. Habakkuk 3, verse 6. This is a book that most persons probably may not have read. Habakkuk 3, verse 6. Notice, Olam is Strong's age 57, 69. There it is, perpetual hills. And it is the same word that is used to describe God. His, that is God's ways, are everlasting. Same, same number. Strong's age 5769. Perpetual, Strong's age 5769. The hills had a beginning, but God has no beginning. So in this one verse, the two meanings can be clearly seen. The hills had a beginning, while God, who is everlasting, has no beginning. So this verse, that's why I said it's very interesting. Proves that olam does not always mean time without a beginning. So that is very clear. And that is why I've searched the scriptures to show you th that the original Hebrew has various ways 
and has many intended meaning. So the context of the verse is what will clearly identify what is being conveyed. So it is clear, my friends, that the hills have a beginning, but God is truly everlasting, without beginning nor ending, because he is eternal. And you can see this in Moses' prayer in Psalm 90, when Moses said, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Everlasting is Strong's H, 5769, Olam. So the phrase everlasting God is found in only three verses in the King James Version. Genesis 21, verse 33, Isaiah 40, verse 28, which we looked at earlier, and Romans 16, verse 26, and is only applied to God the Father. This is simply because God the Father is the only being that has no beginning nor ending. My friends, I hope you are seeing the picture clearly. When Jesus states in Proverbs 8, verse 23, that I was set up from everlasting, he is simply saying that he was installed and anointed from ancient time. That is a time so far in the remote past that it could be considered eternity because time as we know it did not exist. Time as humans know it actually began when planet earth was created. Proverbs 8 is simply talking to human beings. Notice what God said in Genesis 1 verse 14. God said this, let there be lights, and the light he was referring to, when you read the context, is the sun and the moon. Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So it is the sun and moon that determines how time is measured. It is the rising or setting of the sun that tells us when a new day has arrived, while a new moon tells us when a new month has begun. And that is precisely how we as humans are able to measure time. In Proverbs 8, Jesus, our wisdom, is specifically speaking to mankind, which is evident by verse 4, which says, Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of man. Therefore, Proverbs 8, 23 is outlining that everlasting to us is simply referring to from the beginning or ever the earth was. The beginning, which is the starting point of Earth's history, that is the creation of planet Earth. This verse is telling us that from the beginning is the same thing as ever the Earth was. And the Hebrew word translated as ever in Proverbs 8.23 is the same word translated as before in Proverbs 8.22, which is Strong's H69.24. Let me just show you that as well. So the word Proverbs 8, Proverbs 8, Proverbs 8, verse 22 and 23. Notice this, notice this, my friends. Before is Strong's 8, 69, 24. Ever is Strong's 8, 69, 24. So what Jesus is saying, I was set up from everlasting, a point in time so far in the remote past that it's practically eternity. From the beginning. When? From the beginning. And which beginning is it talking about? Before the earth was. And notice it use or. So from the beginning or before the earth was. So Jesus was begotten before anything was created. That is what Jesus is saying to us as the wisdom of God. He's giving us a sneak peek into what happened before our planet was created. Let us continue, my friends as I break down the scriptures and present the facts. Again, Jesus was begotten and set up in the days of eternity before the earth came into existence and clearly before anything else was created. Everlasting viewers is a term that simply means a period of time that is beyond measure or beyond our finite understanding. Let's continue our detailed exegesis of Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8, verse 24 tells us this. Jesus continues to speak. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding in water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. So twice 
in those verses, Jesus tells us again that he was brought forth before the earth existed. The Hebrew word translated as brought forth is whole, Strong's H 2342. And it appears 61 times in 56 verses of the Westminster Leningrad Codex, which is the oldest complete manuscript of the Hebrew Bible. Whole has been translated in a number of ways to include pain six times, bring forth four times, pain four times, travail four times, carve two times. My friends, just looking at those meanings, it is difficult to avoid the birth language that the word conveys because whole, Strong's H 2342, also means to be born, as well as pain that is associated with the birthing process. My friends, brought forth simply means to come out of, and begotten or born means the very same thing, to come out of. Let me show you from the Blue Letter Bible as we consult the original. I don't want to just take my notes for it. Jesus said here, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. Strong's age 23, 42. And you will see the pronounce, hear the pronunciation for yourself. Strong's age 23, 42. Hul. 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 And the form just below that. Hil. Hil. Okay. So it appears six two times, and these are the various ways in which it has been translated by the King James Version. Notice the outline of biblical usage. To twirl, whirl, dance, writhe, fear, tremble, travail, be in anguish, be pained. To dance, to twist, writhe, to whirl, whirl about. To writhe in travail, bear, to bring forth. And this is talking about labor. To wait anxiously, just like a woman in labor, waiting to be delivered. To be made to writhe, to be made to bear, to be brought forth. To be born. So Jesus is saying that he was born. That is what he's telling us. He was born. And so forth. So the, the, the meaning of the word of the of the word is, is very clear. And just by looking at the, the meaning, it tells you that it's talking about giving birth. So let us continue. And I will show some verses that proves the point. So when Jesus says, I was brought forth, he was saying that I was begotten, I was born from the Father. So let us continue. Scripture does not reveal how Jesus was begotten. It does not reveal how, the how of it, but it does outline very clearly when the Son of God was begotten of the Father. The Scriptures also tell us that both the Father and the Son share the same divine nature, but God the Father has always existed. So he's first in point of time. Therefore, when Jesus, the son of God was born, his personality had a beginning. Notice these verses which use Ul, Strong's H 2342, to denote the birth of an animal or a human and the pain that is associated with the process. Notice these verses. Job 39 verse one. Thou, know, thou knowest, Knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth? And that is Strong's age 3205. That is Yalad, which means to be to begotten, to, to beget. Or canst thou mark when the hinds do calve? And that is Hul, Strong's age 2342. Calve means to bring forth. And that is used for cows that have calves. So God is saying here to Job, Knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth? Or canst thou mark when the hinds do calve? Isaiah 45 verse 10 says, Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Strong's age 3205. Or to the woman, what hast thou brought forth? Same word. A woman brings forth a child when she's pregnant. Cool. Strong's age 2342. The same word that we're looking at. Notice Isaiah 66 and verse 7 and 8. If, and notice the language. This is talking about labor pain, pregnancy, and childbirth. Before she travailed, that is Strong's age 2342, cool, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man child. She gave birth to a son. Isaiah 68, verse 8. 
Who had heard such a thing? Who had, such, who had seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth? That is whole, Strong's age 2342 in one day. Or shall a nation be born? See, bring forth means born. Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, Strong's age 2342, whole, she brought forth her children. So it is very clear, my friends. It is birthing language. Jesus is telling us in Proverbs 8 that he was born of God. All these verses, my friends, viewers, give the unmistakable idea that to be brought forth means to come from another, whether an animal or human, or in this case, God the Father. In like manner, Jesus is telling us that he was brought forth from the very substance or nature of God the Father. In other words, Jesus was literally begotten or born of God at a particular time, particular point in time. Therefore, there was clearly a time when God the Father was the only being that was in existence. This idea can be illustrated in the following ways, way as seen below. I drafted up a little time continuum. So we have eternity past, where God the Father was alone in existence. And at some point in eternity past, in the days of eternity, he brought forth his only begotten son. And then his only begotten son created all things. So he created the angels. And then after a point in time, there was a rebellion in heaven that is spoken about in Revelation chapter 12. Devil's rebellion in heaven. And after that, our planet was created. Then he had the fall of man. And then the plan of salvation was instituted. And then the next great event that will take place is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then after that, we move into eternity future. Time will cease to be and we move into eternity where time is no longer a factor. Because for per when, when we inherit eternal life, we will not be looking at time. Time will be of no moment. So my friends, Jesus continues to tell us about what transpired before and during the creation of our world in Proverbs 8, reading from verse 26. Jesus continues, and he's telling us what the Father did. While as yet he, God the Father, had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he, that is God the Father, prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he, God the Father, established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight. And I was daily his delight rejoicing always before him. My friends, the preceding verses tie in perfectly with what the beloved disciple wrote in John 1, verse 1. Notice what John wrote. And this backs up what Jesus is saying about himself in Proverbs 8. John wrote, in the beginning, and that is the beginning of our world, the creation of planet Earth, was the word, and the word was with God. Jesus said, I was with him, and I was by him. So in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same word was in the beginning with God. Jesus, my friends, confirms what is written in Proverbs, I mean, not Jesus, John confirms what is written in Proverbs 8, verse 27 and verse 30, and tells us that Jesus, the word, was present with God, the Father, in the beginning when our planet was created. Jesus, speaking through Solomon, clearly outlines that he was with the Father by saying this, I was there and I was by him as one brought up with him. My friends, the Hebrew word translated as one brought up is Amon, Strong's H 525. It is derived from the Hebrew root word Amon, Strong's H 539, which means to bring up or train up a child. Notice this verse, which proves the meaning of the word. And I will show you the, the, the word here. So it says here, I was brought up. Let me go to the, 
blue letter Bible and go back to, so it says here, Jesus said in his own words, then I was by him as one brought up with him, brought up is this word, Amon. This is the pronunciation. Strong's H 525. Amon. 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 It says it comes from this root word, probably in the sense of, of training, one brought up. And it also means a master workman. And if you look at the root word from which it, it is derived, it tells us that it gives the idea to support, confirm, be faithful, uphold, nourish. And the verse that I want to, to highlight is this, is, this is where this particular word is used. Esther 2 verse 7. And it says, and he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, who Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So what this verse is saying is that Mordecai raised Esther as his own daughter. And here is the word that is used for brought up, Aman. So it's the same word that Jesus is using of himself. He said that he was brought up by the father as one brought up with him. So Jesus is very clear in what he's saying about himself. So it is very clear. And that is the verse that we read earlier. So Amon, Strong's H 525, also means a master or cunning workman. And this again is in perfect harmony with the scriptures because Jesus was the principal agent of creation. God the Father created all things by and through his son. And this is confirmed by Hebrews 1, verse 2. As we continue to explore Proverbs 8, my friends, by searching the scriptures, it is absolutely clear that Jesus Christ is wisdom being personified. The following verses below leaves us with absolutely no doubt in the matter. Proverbs 8, verse 34 says, Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. My friends, did not Jesus say in John 10, verse 7 and verse 9, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Beloved, verse 35 of Proverbs 8 tells us this. For whoso findeth me, findeth life, and shall obtain favor of Jehovah, who is God the Father. This verse, again, tells us that wisdom is indeed a person because life can only be found in one person, the Son of God. By virtue of his divine birth, Jesus Christ also inherited his father's life. Notice Jesus' words which corroborate this fact. John 5 verse 26 tells us this. Jesus is speaking, for as the father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the son to have life in himself. Notice the verse, you know, very key verse. For as the father had life in himself, so had he given to the son to have life in himself. This life is eternal and self-existent. But don't miss the point that Jesus himself made. It, that the son receives this life from the father, which means the son could not have always existed with the father from all eternity. Because the father is the one that gave the son life. And the life that the Father has is eternal life, our self-existent life, life that is not dependent on anybody else. The Father is not dependent on any, anyone else for life. And he gave the Son that life. So if Jesus was co-eternal with the Father, as the Trinitarian doctrine teaches, then the Father could not have given him that life because he would have already had that life. But Jesus said, notice, his father given, given to the son to have life in himself. So this verse actually destroys the teaching of the Trinity doctrine, which speaks about the father and the son being co-eternal. Jesus is here saying to us that his father gave him life in himself. So the life that Jesus has is self-existent, but it was given to him by his father. Very important point that must not be missed. Notice the following verses as well in John 10. 
verse 27. Jesus tells us that he's the one that gives eternal life. John 10, 27 onwards. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Notice his words again. My father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. So Jesus here again tells us that his father is greater than all, including himself. Friends, Jesus is the channel through which eternal life is given. And he said as much again in John 17, verse 1 and 2, when he was praying. This is what he said. Scriptures tell us, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Jesus is very clear, my friends. His father gave him eternal life and he is the one that gives eternal life to as many as the Father has given him. Notice these powerful verses as well in 1, John 1, in 1 John 5, reading from verse 11 onwards. Very important. Because Jesus said in Proverbs 8, Whoso findeth me, findeth life. And I'm making the point that life is in the Son. And John, the beloved apostle, said as much. This is what he wrote. And this is a record that God had given to us eternal life. And where is this eternal life? And this life is in his son. And notice what John says. He that hath the son hath life. And he that hath not the son of God hath not life. So life is in the son of God. The only begotten son of God. Not a metaphor. The literal begotten son of God. Notice verse 13 of 1 John 5. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So John is making it very clear that Jesus is indeed the Son of God that was begotten of God the Father in the days of eternity. These verses, my friends, prove that to find wisdom is to find life, because eternal life is in the Son of God who is wisdom personified. The final verse in Proverbs 8 also tells us that wisdom is a person. Proverbs 8 verse 36 says, But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. This is simply because an individual cannot sin against wisdom, an abstract notion. We can only sin against a person. And to be more blunt, we can only sin against God. Notice again these words from the mouth of God himself. Exodus 32, verse 33. And Jehovah said unto Moses, Whosoever had sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Look at these verses from Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. Know therefore that Jehovah, thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repay them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. So God is being very clear because remember Proverbs 8, 36, the last verse says, he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me loveth death. And God is saying, if you hate him, he will repay you to your face to destroy you. He will not be slack to him that hated him. He will repay him to his face. My friends, let's now, as I bring this presentation to a close, examine Jesus' own words when he was on earth. Did Jesus teach that he was begotten or came forth from the Father? He most certainly did on more than one occasion. See John 7, reading from verse 28 to 30. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself. But he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. My friends, Jesus is very clear. He gives two 
distinct reasons why he knows the father. One, he is from him. That is, Jesus is God's son and they share the same divine nature. And two, his father sent him. First, as I tell you that when he says, I am from him, he is saying that he is from heaven. But that's not what he's saying. Jesus was not simply saying that I am from heaven because angels are also from heaven and they don't know the father like Christ. Matthew 11 verse 27 confirms what Jesus said. And this is what he said in Matthew 11 verse 27. All things are delivered unto me of my father. And notice what he said. And no man knoweth the, the son but the father. Neither knoweth any man the father save the son and he to whomsoever the son will reveal him. This statement from Jesus drives another nail into the coffin of the Trinitarian view because there is no other being in the entire universe that knows the Father like the Son. You'd have to ask yourself the question, did Jesus forget the Holy Spirit? Jesus, my friends, is the word of God or truth personified. And he did not include, quote unquote, God the Holy Spirit because there is no such being. Jesus knows that the Holy Spirit is not a third divine being as the Trinity doctrine teach, but indeed the spirit of his father and his own spirit. Only the son knows the father best, no one else. Additionally, my friends, Jesus told the Jews the very same thing as he did in John chapter seven. That is, he was begotten of the father. Notice these words again in John eight, verse 41 and 42. A very interesting exchange between Jesus and the Jews. Jesus said to them, ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would, you would love me for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. The Greek word translated as proceeded forth is exor homai. And I will go to the, the Blue Letter Bible to look at the original language so you can see the actual meaning that is being conveyed. John 8, verse 42. Jesus said, for I proceeded forth, Strong's G, 1831. This is the pronunciation this is the greek script and this is how it is pronounced strong's g 1831 ex erchamai ex erchamai ex and it means it is translated 222 times 60 times as go out 34 times as come 28 times as depart 9 times as come forth it means to go or come forth off. And it is used with mention of the place out of which one goes or the point from which he departs. Of those who leave a place of their own accord, of those who are expelled or cast out. And even the Blue Letter Bible thinks that it is talking about a metaphorical birth, but that is not what it is saying. Notice the other meanings, but they claim it is metaphorical. Jesus was literally born of God. It says, to come forth from physically, arise from to be born off, to go forth from one's power, escape from it in safety. And the other meanings here, to come forth, emitted as from the heart or the mouth, to flow forth from the body, to emanate, issue. So the verse means, the word means to be born. So when Jesus said, I proceeded forth, I was, Jesus is saying, I was born of God. So, Exer Homai, Strong's G, 1831, means to go or come forth off, as well as to come forth from physically, to be born off, to flow forth from the body or to emanate. And you can see Hebrews 7, verse 5, which uses the same word. When the writer of Hebrews said, the sons of Levi come out of the loins of Abraham. Come is the same word, Exor Homai, Strong's G, 1831. What was happening, my friends, in, in, the, in this verse is that the Jews were ridiculing Jesus by casting doubt on the circumstances surrounding his earthly birth by saying, and I quote, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. 
Because remember, there was some controversy surrounding the earthly birth of Jesus because Mary was found with child and she was not married. But the Bible makes it very clear that before Joseph and Mary came together, she brought forth her firstborn son. So they were now going back in the past and they were insinuating that Jesus was a jacket, as we would say in Jamaica, or an illegitimate son. So Jesus rightly told them whose son he was since they were questioning his paternity. Jesus told them in no uncertain terms that he was, a, he was born of God and that God was his father. Notice these words again from the lips of Jesus in John 16, reading from verse 27 and verse 29 as I bring the presentation to a close. For the father himself loveth me. So Jesus was speaking to his, his disciples. For the father himself loveth you because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. Same word, Strong's G, 1831. Jesus said he came out. He was born from God. And he repeats the same sentiment in the following verse. I came forth from the Father, Strong's G, 1831. And I'm come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. So the disciples believed that he was indeed born literally from the Father. And they said, By this we believe that thou camest forth, Strong's G, 1831, exor homai, which means to be born from God. And then Jesus answered them, do we now believe? I just want to show you these verses and show you the original Greek. John 16, verse 20, 28. I want, to, want, want to see that he, the Greek word is Strong's G 1831. Notice, Jesus said, I, I came out from God, Strong's G 1831, ex or homai. I came forth from the Father, Strong's G 1831. And then the disciples repeated the same thing. It says, where is it? It says, by this we believe that thou camest forth, Exeromai, Strong G, 1831, from God. And Jesus answered them, do we now believe? My friends, I have presented all the facts to you, the scriptural evidence. The disciples believed that Jesus was literally begotten of the Father in the days of eternity. The question posed by Jesus to the disciples is very powerful. And I would like to end by asking you, the viewers, do you now believe that Jesus Christ was literally begotten of the Father and that he was begotten in the days of eternity and that he has not always existed with the Father? This presentation provided a lot of scriptures to establish when Jesus was begotten of the Father and clearly showed that this took place in the days of eternity. That, my friends, was very detailed. I have presented all the scriptural evidence as it relates to Proverbs 8 and what the intended meaning of that chapter is. Jesus in that chapter is speaking under the title of wisdom. And he tells us plainly by looking at the original language that he was born of God and that he was indeed begotten in the days of eternity at a certain point in eternity and that he has not always existed with the father. He was brought forth from the father at that particular time and he inherited all the divine attributes and prerogatives of the father my friends i hope you have seen the evidence and it's now up to you to make your decision as to what you will believe the next presentation in this series will be looking at micah chapter 5 verse 2 which also tells us when jesus was also begotten it is tied to proverbs 8 verse 20 to 30. The next presentation, I will look at Micah 5, verse 2, and show you that Jesus had a beginning by looking at the original Hebrew 
Thank you for watching. If you like this presentation, please subscribe to the channel for future content. Turn, hit the notification bell, and you'll be the first to be notified when the next video is uploaded in this series as we continue to look at the Trinity doctrine by refuting the commonly held view that God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. I have proven by this presentation that Jesus had a beginning and he was begotten or born in the days of eternity. And I hope that the evidence was clear. I believe it is overwhelming. And it is up to you, my friends, the viewers, to make your decision as to what you will believe. Thanks for watching and may God continue to bless us as we continue to study his words so that we can be edified and God's name can be glorified. Have yourselves a wonderful day.